And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the World Anvil Publishing, no, not that one, and creators of the up of the upcoming upside down fairy tale epic known as Broken Tales, which managed to get funded in ten minutes. Congratulations, by the way. The one and only Tommaso De Benetti. How you doing? Thank today, you, man? thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, you pronounce it correctly. Thank <laughs> you. Oh. So it's a, so uh, it's a bit. First off, as I said before, congratulations on how well the uh, how well the project has go has gone so far. You were let me um let me convert. You were only asking for five thousand euro at the time, and you're currently at um just under sixty six thousand. So congratulations on yeah. that. Thank you. Um, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what about it made it stick for you? How did I start? Um, yeah, I've been playing, I'm 38 now, I've been playing for 29 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I started when I was 9. Um, we used to go to, to the mountains in the summer, uh, we had a cottage there uh, in Italy. Uh, this is somewhere close to the Alps, I think, this is the... Uh, probably the, the easiest way I can describe it um, for an international audience. Um, the, the, there was a camp in there and uh, I had uh, friends um, and one summer, uh, I was about nine, uh, I came, I think I think it was maybe the first day of that year uh, where, where I was at the, uh, the, the camping and uh, somebody was playing HeroQuest. Uh, and I got really intrigued by by Hero Quest, and I was like, oh, "What is this thing? I never seen a board game like that." Maybe I was used to stuff like Monopoly, you know, or mm -hmm. uh, Risk, something a bit uh, simpler. And Hero Quest was really different for me, and um, I got really hooked immediately. And I think I think it was the same day, but maybe the day after. Um, a friend that was playing with me say, "Hey, I know of something even better." I said, whoa, whoa, what was that? Uh, and then um, he, he said, uh, uh, my brother has D&D &D and I know how to run it. And if you want, I can, I can show you. And then we went into uh, his little cottage and uh, he ran the first uh, session mm -hmm. for us. And it was, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was something about killing giant rats um, in a basement. Uh, very, very traditional uh, kind of first session and it made my head explode it was something like I never even uh, conceived that you could do mm -hmm. um, and this this thing that you had to make the world in, in your in your head and, and uh, imagine what these characters were doing was uh, mind-blowing like you know those uh, Eureka moment moments that you don't have very often in life but but uh, you know when you have one it's like whoa what is this thing and uh, it's been uh, love since then. Uh, of course, uh, over the course of 29 years, uh, there's been up and downs. Um, I I had a long uh, break in between, uh, not because I wanted, but because I moved to another country and uh, I didn't have um, a group to play with here. Uh, but then, uh, you know, um, I started playing online with some old friends and. Uh, well, and now I'm here. I'm running a an RPG tabletop RPG label. So yeah. Yeah. Now, when, now um, that bring that brings me to broke to broken tales. Now, obviously, broken tales is is descri is described as a RPG of upside down fairy tales. Um, this may be reaching a bit far back, but. What was your what was your early introduction or reintroduction to fairy tales, and what what do you think is the appeal of that particular form of storytelling? Well, um, I have to say, when I was a kid, uh, my mom um, he narrated, I think, a couple of uh, really big, beautiful, bounded books 
Uh, I think one was dedicated 100% to uh, um, 1,000 and one nights, and the other one was more uh, about the, the Green Brothers and Anderson. And, and uh, well, she used to read fairy tales to me uh, before going to bed, so I have a very um, childlike wonder when it comes to fairy tale. It brings me back to my to my childhood. Uh, I'm, I'm very fond of them, and um, I always feel that they are interesting because the story they're telling it's not um the story on the surface uh, very often they want there's other there's another meaning behind the the main story and um i always thought that as a narrative um uh freak that that was interesting because they are really trying to make you understand something else not just the events of the of the story and even as an adult, well, I, I try to read um, everything. I don't want to just, I don't know, read just fantasy books. I don't think that's healthy. Uh, but I try to to have like uh, some some fiction and uh, then something that is nonfiction. Um, maybe some uh, some book about uh, some biography, something where I can learn something new. You know, I, I try to to alternate between between uh, genres. Uh, but I find myself very often uh, attracted to stuff like myths and uh, and um, 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 stories. For, for example, in, in, in right now I'm reading a book about uh, Greek gods. It's not the first one I read. It's just one. It's a Stephen Fry um, book. He made a couple that are really interesting. One is about the gods. And one is about the the, the heroes. And I think he has a new one out that is just about Troy. Uh, but I, I've been reading these stories in, in 100 different ways. I'm, I'm uh, listening to the audiobook of the Iliad now <laughs> for the first time, the original, mm -hmm. because I read some uh, rewritten version before, but I never read the original. So I, I decided to listen to the audiobook and I find it quite interesting. Uh, and then, uh, for example, recently I bought some books about um, uh, genes in the in the Middle East mm -hmm. because there's a whole mythology there that I'm not um, very aware of, and I wanted to learn more. Uh, I have books about the Swedish fairy tales. I live in the, in, in Finland, mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'm immersed in nature. There's a lot of um, um, uh, legends and myths here about about woods and trolls and stuff like that. Uh, Sweden is the neighboring country, but uh, uh, the stories are quite similar. Uh, the, the 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 main one in Finland is called Kalevala. Uh, it's uh, some kind of the, the prototype of Lord of the Ring or, or something like that. It's it's a bit weird uh, as a story. I, I don't know it too well. I actually, I should uh, read the original at some point. But yeah, I I don't know. I'm fascinated by these stories that the um, they don't get old. They don't get old. They are still very um, current in a way that they deal mostly with uh, urges that uh, we still have thousands of years after they came up with the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, um, especially this, this is especially true for maybe the Greek stuff or, or the Jin uh, stories when it comes to the Green Brothers and uh, Anderson. They are more recent, but still that uh, we haven't evolved much from um, th those problems, you know. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is something that comes to some some that comes to mind when you were mentioning myth, when you're mentioning myths and fairy tales is um, when Joseph Campbell said that the West that the American um, Western is a mo is a modern fairy tale in some instances, and I think to an, I think to a certain degree he's right. Um, also, as far as far as as far as a book on Greek myth. It's probably for the best that I di that I didn't write it because I probably would have titled it "Local Zeus Ruins Everything." <laughs> yeah, it's a great title. <laughs> um, it's a it's a great t it's I, I'll probably I'll pro it's a great title, but I'm pretty sure Myth Myths Explained has used it because that that's kind of hit that's kind of his thing. Um, he did a he did a trunk he did a summary of Gilgamesh called called the ultimate Sumerian bromance. Yeah. Okay. Um. But that br that brings me to given that appreciation for um for mythology and for 
whether whether it be in the local form like like fairy tales or something more grandiose um with broken tales you're taking you're taking the idea of a lot of these these fo these popular well established um fairy tales and turning the, and turning it on its head what w what with the idea of tur of going upside down with it where did the inspiration for that come from yeah so i have to um mentioned that I am not the main author of the game, mm -hmm. even though I do supervise basically everything about it. Yeah. Um, the main author is Alberto. Uh, Alberto Tronchi is a longtime collaborator. Uh, he's not uh, technically part of the company, but we've been, this is already our third game together, so kind of spiritually he is. Mm -hmm. uh, together with Daniel, which is the illustrator of the game, uh, uh, Daniel has been working I think on 100% of our project. So we're very close, but we, at the moment, we are two separate uh, entities in a way that if they want, they can also do games for other people. Mm -hmm. But lately we've been mostly working together because we are very, we are on the same frequencies. So we understand each other. Uh, there's a mutual respect. I think uh, we're treating each other well. Um, there's a good exchange of ideas uh, and, and, there's very little we have to explain to each other. We we understand each other on the fly, so it's it's a nice way to work, and I think we will continue working together in the future. Uh, but with Alberto, yeah, I think uh, our background, uh, uh, cultural background, it's so similar that um, uh, I actually I discovered I dis I found out about him uh, from a previous game called Evolution Pulse. Uh, this is a science fiction. Um, version of it because uh, then together we published uh, um, a fantasy one that is called Evolution Pulse Rebirth, uh, uh, Rinascita in Italian. The for in English we have the quick start, we don't have the full game. Um, and uh, in that game, in Evolution Pulse, the science fiction, it, it's something very close to Tsuomo Nihei Blam. I don't know if you know the the anime and the manga. Uh, it's this very dystopian oh, future. Blam! I love Blam. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very very close to that. Mm -hmm. uh, very much inspired. And uh, in the book, um, like to separate one chapter from the other, Alberto often uh, quoted some songs, mm -hmm. um, and and I knew one hundred percent of the songs. Uh, one of, if I remember correctly, he also has a quote of. Uh, uh, an artist that I have uh, as a tattoo on my on my back, so we were that close spiritually, you know. Um, and that that's how how the collaboration started. We met at the events first, and then and then we started um, meeting outside events. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I think this was an idea he pitched, uh, and it's funny because well, this is a story I think I will tell to to um, to the to all backers before the end of the campaign but he pitched it as a, as a super super small game like a fanzine game mm -hmm. a zine game uh that we would print in black and white on this uh you know this uh just normal i wouldn't say toilet paper but almost and uh give for free at events as a promotional thing mm -hmm. um to to introduce people to the system because the system that uh, we use in broken tales uh, is used also in, in uh, some of our other games. So we thought, okay, hey, this would be a good idea. So we give away this thing. Uh, it's going to be super cheap to make. Uh, it's a gift. Uh, people will check it out and they will play and uh, maybe they will get interested in other games. Yeah. And uh, I find myself uh, two years later that this is our main project. It is our most successful project by far. It is uh, the most lavish project when it comes to the graphic design. Uh, it changed a lot from what it was supposed to be. And uh, I think that it took us a while to figure out um, how to do it, why to do it this way, uh, what the project needed to uh, appeal. Um, but this final form that we found, it's definitely uh, much better than the initial idea, and not. I'm not saying it just because. Um, well, it's 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 clearly um, a successful project by Kickstarter standards, but because I think it is the best game it could be uh, now, and maybe it wasn't in its original 
in its original version. So uh, yeah, that's that's uh, the, the the way projects change over time when you spend time thinking about them and uh, how do you pack them, uh, package them? Sorry, uh, how do you um, promote them? How do you make people interested in them? It, it's quite interesting, and this happened before for other for other projects we were working on. Uh, some were, for example, um, set aside after. Uh, spending considerable considerable resources uh, on them because at some point we felt like we don't think this has the potential we thought it had so maybe we should stop now before uh, we hurt ourselves <laughs> you know uh, and this is valid also for games that I develop myself like I have a couple of projects in the drawer uh, that I would really want to publish but I know they're not good enough yet so I'm parking them there and I might find the good a good way to pick them um, back up and and um, repackage them in a way that actually works mm -hmm. um, I'm a harsh critic of my own design stuff so if I don't think it's good enough and I have a very high bar mm -hmm. I throw away my, my own stuff very quickly now I know that I know that the game I know that the game ha is essentially having two essentially having um two mo two modes tell me a story yeah. and the story book but yeah which would you say that Broken Tales leans more f leans more towards episodic style play than a than anything else So the problem we tried to solve with Broken Tales was that um often it is hard to to get a group that has been in one of these long campaigns i know of i don't know D, &D campaigns that are like three four five years long i don't even know how people can really play the same thing for four or five years in a row i'm really not into that anymore maybe i was when i was a teenager but i i really can't do that anymore i i, I need some variety in my life but um we wanted people not to have any excuse not to try Broken Tales. And the way the the game is made now is that the the narrator, the storyteller, uh, needs very little preparation because uh, by the end of this campaign, they will have, um, I think it's going to be like around 15 already written scenarios mm -hmm. that they just need to read and everything they need is there. Um, and players don't need to learn the rules because everything they need is uh, either on the hunter sheet or we're going to have an extra sheet that you can place on the table and and the rule for example the the rules for for uh, rolling the dice are going to be on that one yeah uh, they don't need to read the book they don't need to know the setting uh, because there is this kind of um, uh, intuitive uh, understanding of what a fairy tale is and uh, even though uh, Broken Tales is kind of uh, twisting some of it. You still have some expectations from Red Riding Hood and uh, Peter Pan and um, mm -hmm. what have you. So um, I don't think people have an excuse not to try Broken Tales because mm -hmm. they can just play it for one evening if they want, just one scenario. Uh, some scenarios are longer, probably it's going to be three, four sessions. But uh, in general, Mm, you don't have to play a uh, um, 20 sessions campaign to see the potential of the game. For example, our previous game, uh, Vara Raven, um, it's uh, um, heavily based on uh, mangas like Berserk, if you're familiar with it. Oh, yes. Uh, and be yes. because it is, uh, th that is not translated. Uh, we have it only in Italian. It was our previous campaign. It was quite successful for being just in Italian. Um, I guess that would be interested in English as well, but uh, let's see because um, we probably need to make games that work in both languages. But um, so that game, because you you're running some kind of war campaign, mm -hmm. uh, it's even divided in seasons, uh, and th these are not um, literal seasons, but they're more like war seasons. So to see the full potential of the game, uh, you would have to play several sessions in a row. And uh, while we have a lot of people playing the game and we're very happy about how it's going, we know that some groups will never do that because they don't want to commit for 
for three months or six months or whatever it is. And with this game, we wanted a group to say, hey, this evening, just this evening, because I don't know, Bob is missing and uh, he will be back next week. We can try this. And Broken Tales allows you to do that. And uh, that's the beauty of it. And it's, uh, it's designed with that in mind. That said, there will be um, a way to connect uh, all the scenarios that we provide or the one that people, because people will be able to make their own uh, in, in, um, in a somewhat current campaign because the, hunt, the idea is that the hunters move around Europe and try to solve these uh, cases, let's call them this way, um, where uh, the, good, the usual good guys have gone um, uh, mad, pretty much. And they, they need to solve the situation. Um, so you can definitely um, make a campaign out of Broken Tales. We actually even unlocked one special scenario um, uh, during the campaign that uh, can be dropped in the middle of any game campaign. And it's about uh, Sharazad, um, mm -hmm. which uh, is in the uh, 1001 Night, the storyteller. And in this game, she is also some somewhat a storyteller, but she works for the enemy. And uh, the beauty of that character is that uh, she knows everything about what... Uh, she knows all the exploits of the hunters. So there's some kind of meta narrative there going on. And, uh, well, let's see where we get with the campaign, but I think there's going to be more of this meta stuff um, if we manage to reach certain uh, goals. Um, we, we think it's uh, funny and it's interesting to play this way. We also don't want to build uh, this kind of gigantic universe of meta plot like a World of Darkness or because um, it gets tricky there. Then people get paralyzed trying not to break anything in the meta plot and uh, uh, at least for this game we don't want to do that. We have one game uh, that has that but th this is not that game. So. Yeah. This this seems like a, for lack of a better term, this seem this seems like it leans a little bit more in the beer and pretzels end of that particular um, paradigm. Um, yeah, maybe. Now, now, um, one of the things I wa one of the things that I wanted to get into a bit more detail is, you talk about the traditional creation process being reversed when it comes to when it comes to character creation. Um, Starting from, um, starting from a narrative concept, and then and then ha and then handling the math. Um, in that regard, I'd like you to go into character creation because the um, some of the some of the hunter sheets that are that are talked about throughout the book may give the impression that this is doing something a bit playbook based, like say Pod by the Apocalypse, and I get the feeling that's not exactly accurate. Yeah, so the way that works, uh, the way even those hunters are built, is that, first of all, um, you describe the character. You write a couple of, of even three sentences about what this character is. Okay, this is true for all the Monodeco games. Mm -hmm. You describe the character. You don't start rolling dice. You don't start uh, from the attributes. You start describing who your character is. Okay? Um one good thing about that is that it doesn't pigeonhole you into classes or archetypes uh, before you even have a chance to think about who your character is. Um, when you have that description, uh, if you check the, the sheets on the, on the um, quick start, uh, it's, it's basically the, the description at the top. When you have that, uh, and in our case, uh, you are describing a villain and uh, the, the, uh, from a fairy tale, they have become good, but they retain something of their original nature. Um, so you can rebuild them. For example, um, James the Swordman is based on Captain Hook, mm -hmm. but it, in this game, he is not a pirate. He is uh, bon vivant. I, I'm not sure what's the English word for that. Um, he likes... Um, um, good company, he likes good wine, good food, uh, entertaining uh, damsels and, and uh, things like that. He's not a pirate at all. 
Uh, he still has, however, an issue with someone called Peter. And uh, there is a beast hunting him. And the beast has hidden his hand. Uh, and that becomes also a power that he has, but we can go into that later. Mm -hmm. So once you have this description, uh, what we ask you to do at uh, the system level is that to underline some keywords. These keywords are uh, somewhat the pillars of the character. Mm -hmm. From these keywords, you uh, create what we call the descriptors. Descriptors are things that... Um, describe how your character is uh, and what he can do well and what he cannot do uh, that well. Uh, for example, uh, let me... Now I need to bring something up very quickly. Mm -hmm. But um, I was thinking uh, the other day, I was, I, was, I was making this example in, the, in, the, in our Discord. Uh, if I'm trying to do one of the little pigs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the descriptor that the little pig could have is that um, I love living in mud, but I smell. Okay, so there's always some positive thing and some negative aspect of this descriptor. Mm -hmm. Why? Because um, during the game, if you have one of these, if, if one of your descriptors is applying to a situation, let's say that he wants to uh, crawl uh, through a trench undetected. Because he has this descriptor, I love living in mud, for him this, uh, this, this whole action might be basically automatic, okay? Um, but because he smells, if he tries to go undetected uh, um, in another situation, in maybe a more social situation, uh, then his smell will become a problem. Mm -hmm. That's how the system kind of works. Uh, and then, well, these descriptors, if you have a descriptor that applies to the, to the action, uh, you, by default, get three successes uh, in an action. And if, if nothing applies, then you just get one. And the idea is that uh, you can either spend some points to reach a certain opposition level that the narrator will give you, that the storyteller will give you. You can spend this point, they're called uh, Soma Points. But they're um, a finite resource, so once you spend them, it takes time for you to recover. Or you can roll dice. And uh, the, the, the whole mechanic with the dice is this. Any number except one counts as a success. But if even one single die rolls a one, the whole action fails. And here is where um, there is some balancing and risk factor to consider. Because you can even mix this um, this thing of spending points and rolling dice, and you can decide. You can basically decide how many dice uh, you want to roll, because uh, you have to at least get to the opposition level that the storyteller is, is giving you. But um, if you uh, overcome it and you go over it, you get better uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. There are three different types of outcome. Uh, if you just arrive at the opposition level, you get an outcome with a cost. It means that your action is successful, but also something else happened that is not positive for you, right? Mm -hmm. If you go over one point to the opposition level, your action uh, succeeds exactly as you described it. And if you uh, pass it by two, then not only the action succeeds, but also um, you get an increment, which is... Uh, something you can uh, spend uh, to either inflict more damage or activate a special power or uh, um, somewhat it gives you an advantage in, in the in the situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm being clear, but I'm trying. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the die system that you have, um, how is it generated how many D6 are actually going to be rolled? Is that something that's going to be determined by the um, player or... Is there yeah, it is, it, it, it is determined by the player because, as I mentioned, you can, uh, like in this game, you decide to which outcome you're aiming to before rolling. You can say, okay, I really need, I really need that this action succeeds without any cost. Mm -hmm. And then you count, like, basically how many gap points do you have 
from what your descriptor, from how many uh, successes your descriptors are giving you and the opposition level. And that gap, you need to decide how to fill it. You can either spend the points or roll the dice. But the, 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 um, the catch there is that the more dice you roll, the higher the risk that you get at least one one in on the, on the uh, die uh, side, right? So and, and and you just need a single one for the whole thing to fail. So um, after a bit of um, after players have been playing for a bit, they start uh, rewiring their brain that okay, I really need that kind of outcome. Should I spend my points now so I don't have them later? because uh, I don't want to risk it, or should I spend one point and roll two dice because the risk is acceptable, etc. Mm -hmm. And well, I guess there are um, strategies there that you can come up with after a while you play. But um, yeah, in general, the system is pretty easy. This uh, roll mechanic takes a bit to, for people to get used to because it's different from other games. Mm -hmm. you, you decide before what you're trying to achieve. And the, only then you decide how much you need to roll. Uh, and I, I, I saw that, for example, some players, uh, they roll and they, um, they uh, um, sum the, the, the numbers together. But in this game, doesn't, that doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense because the only number you don't want on those dice is a one. Any other number it counts just as a success. Mm -hmm. So you want successes and not ones, if, if I'm being clear. Yeah. And when it comes now, I w normally I would ask about uh, about a extra effort mechanic because a lot of games have those, but I think that question has been answered with the presence of Soma. So instead, what I will ask is gen is whenever there's a limited resource, um, there's a tendency for players to be fairly defensive with it the whole ra the whole rainy day paradox or um so or yeah. ho or holding off for holding off that healing potion for when you need it and then it's the end of the campaign and you never used it <laughs> um i'm sure we're all guilty of that i know i am and how when it comes to the use of um so of soma um what do you, how do you how do you step how do you stem that particular issue so that so that it's not a habit for everyone to be as defensive as possible and hoard as mu and hoard as much soma for for the end of the encounter even if that never comes right uh so um broken is because of the because of, of its structure uh um where uh we're going mostly for one shots or anyway very short campaigns does not encourage that because um first of all you can regenerate soma and there are a couple of ways you can inflict yourself a, a wound uh, to regenerate some mm -hmm. or uh, uh, the other option is that you take a rest but uh, because npcs and enemies uh, and even dangers they have uh, their own agenda those agendas progress even when you like if you're taking a nap uh, you cannot expect the the villain to uh just wait for you while you take a nap so uh these characters have an agenda that progresses and it doesn't matter what you do like if you are not on on the scene they will do their own stuff and uh without you with or without you right so you can uh, regenerate soma when you take a rest but then there is this this issue that you need to know that uh the agenda of the other characters and dangers and uh, events can progress mm -hmm. uh, while you do that uh, as i mentioned because we're going mostly for one shots we don't have much of that problem uh here because people know that they can spend soma they're allowed to spend soma and if that isn't enough, uh, when you are too conservative with it, it means that to succeed, you have to roll a lot of dice. And you realize pretty quickly how often ones come out when you roll a lot of dice. So you want to somewhat uh, protect yourself from risking it too much. And uh, uh, that means basically spending Soma 
to remove dice from from uh, your hand, you know. Mm -hmm. And like, and um, given that you given that you mentioned um, wounds, I'm cu I'm curious about I'm curious about that because while I'm no stranger to wound systems, there's often different there's often different approaches. Um, when it comes to our the most the most popular approach is the whole escalating penalties kind of approach. Um, World of Darkness being the poster child for this kind of thing. When it comes to damage and wounds in Broken Tales, do you operate on something operate on something similar, or is it more of um, the more wounds you have, the the you have a um, higher amount you have a higher threshold for getting soma, but also a higher chance of getting put in the dirt if you push it. No, we we take a narrative approach here as well. First of all, when you um, get a wound, uh, you write down what that wound is. If you write, uh, okay, my shoulder is bleeding, then it means that narratively, uh, if you try to escape the, the scene, uh, it might very well be that the guards will be able to follow your trail of blood on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Because that is your wound, and until you fix it, you have that narrative condition on you. If you break your knee, you are not going to be able to run in the in the in the next action. Um, if you hurt your fingers uh, on your sword hand, you probably won't be as effective uh, in your next action. So the first thing is that to every wound you assign some kind of description. And until you fix it, uh, you have that thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the second aspect is that most of the minor enemies, they just have one wound and every attack inflicts one wound. Every normal attack inflicts one wound. We do not make a, a difference between equipments. This is not a game where you loot and stack equipment. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it all follows the same philosophy. Equipment is a narrative... Um, narrative tool that enables your character to do certain things. If you have a torch in your hand, you can set fire to things. If you do not have a torch in your hand, you cannot set fire to things. If you have a stick, maybe you can use it as a leverage to jump over a gap. If you only have a sword, you cannot do that. So that's the power of equipment. It, it, gives, it opens up narrative options for your character. Uh, we don't have this thing that you have this magic magic sword plus three and then the other guy has the magic armors minus three and then they compensate each other and you are back to square one because frankly i think that's stupid it's a sum zero game uh it just uh, um kind of uh, uh it puts you in the situation where you spend time just making calculations and in the end there's no real advantage of, of having that um, so we didn't want to, to do that, uh, especially for this game. Um, and I forgot if this was your question, I'm sorry. Now, when you were going through character creation, maybe I skimmed it, but one of the things that I didn't hear br brought up is, um, gifts. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm, um, yeah, because I and tend to... Kind of go my own way and then I forget things. No worries. Um, um, I'd, yeah, I'd like uh, you to go into that. Yes. Uh, the, I mentioned that um, after the initial uh, description of your character, you come up with the three descriptors. And these are the things you're good at and bad at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these are also giving you the gifts because, um, well, for the hunters we create, we're going to have, a, um, we're going to give you the gifts. But for the hunters that people will be able to create, we will have some kind of generic uh, archetypal list of gifts. And then we will teach you how to take gifts from the existing hunters and adapt them to your idea in a way that um, you already have some guidelines, but you can you can make some, some changes so it's more thematic, right? Um, but again, they are based on your uh, descriptor. Uh, so, I don't know, this is a stupid example, this is not a real character, but uh, if I have to come up on the spot, I was telling like, okay, the little pig has this uh, descriptor that says, uh, I love living in mud, but, but I smell, right? So one gift that c 
could derive from I love living in mud is that, I don't know, he can burrow into the ground and uh, grab people from, from uh, below, okay? This could be a gift that somewhat is related to that descriptor. Um, and usually uh, gifts can be either activated um, automatically or uh, you can, uh, for example, spend Soma to, to activate special, special effects. Some gifts also will give you increments, special increments, so that when you roll, if you have an increment, uh, beside the normal things that an increment would give you, like more damage, you do this thing faster, um, something good happens that is advantageous to you, maybe you can even trigger a special uh, part of that gift if you spend the increment that way. Now, when it comes to the way you're doing this particular um, di this particular die rolling system, um, are the majority of the rolls um, tested against a di against a difficulty threshold, or are some of them contested rolls? No, uh, it's uh, so. First of all, the the storyteller never rolls. Uh, you always test against a difficulty, uh, we call it opposition level. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three levels in uh, Broken Tales, they're standard. Um, in our, in other, other games, we, we, they are dynamic, but here they're standard. Uh, j just because we want to streamline this game as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So they, they're going to be three, uh, five, and uh, seven. Um, an opposition level of three, if you have... Uh, a descriptor that is relevant to the action, you already get three base successes. That means that without doing anything, so you don't need to roll anything or spend some or nothing, you already get a success with a cost. So by default, if you have a, a descriptor that is relevant to the to the situation, you will get a success with a cost, which we think it's it's much more interesting than just a plain success because yes, you will succeed, but then something happens to complicate the situation. Mm -hmm because that creates some um, dynamism in, 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 in what's going on. And then if you need to reach five or seven, you need to figure out like, do I want to roll? Do I want to spend so much? Do I do half and half, etc. cetera. Um, so there are fixed levels and uh, of, we play tested this um, quite a bit. And uh, it might seem like, okay, there's not much customization here, but it actually uh, works pretty well, even because uh, the storyteller always has the discretion of raising or um, uh, lowering the opposition level by one. If because also NPCs and um, enemies have descriptors, so if if the descriptor of the enemy is particularly advantageous in this situation, they can raise the opposition level by one. If uh, the descriptor gives them uh, some kind of uh, disadvantage, they can lower it by one. So in, in reality, you have a, a wider range of possible uh, opposition levels, uh, but they all start from three, five, and seven, and then you can raise or lower by one. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in in mind, um, I know you meant. I know you mentioned that. Um, that soma is going to be a limited resource and one of the ways to get to um get it is taking a wound but are but what other methods are there to recover soma uh there was this um um uh, you take a break mm -hmm. so you take a break but you know that your character will not be on the scene for a certain amount of time if you say i need to take a nap i need to sleep uh the tavern tonight i need to wait here by the fire uh, it can be okay if the situation is evolving slowly, but if you are in the middle of um, a very hectic situation and uh, the world is ending and the village is on fire, you definitely cannot take a break in that moment. So at that point, what you're left with is that you will have to uh, use mostly dice. And the more dice you use, as I mentioned, the more it's probable that everything uh, implodes <laughs> on you at the most crucial moment. So it creates a lot of drama, this, um, this uh, dynamic, because yes, you want to save Soma, but certain 
in certain checks, you really need this action to succeed because you know that if it doesn't succeed, some, something horrible happens. And in, in certain situations, you might find yourself that you can only roll dice. So everything becomes more risky. People get more excited around the table. And, you know, you have these kind of reactions where everybody's looking at, okay, he's rolling and we know that there are very few possibilities of this going right. Mm -hmm. So I think it creates quite a good dynamic at the table. Yeah. Now, something that, something that I... Haven't really delved too much into, but I want, but I wanted to, but I wanted to get in, in order to cover as many of the bases. Is the visual style that you that you ha that you have for the book? Um, yeah. In particular, the the very um the re the red and the red and black the red and black and white ap approach for one and two the fact that um. There's a very there's a very vinyl album cover des design throughout the book. Um, were were there some were there some strong musical influences that prompted that? Well, uh, it's it's hard to 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 say because in a way I am a collector of both both um, RPG books, and uh, whenever I can get my hands on a super limited edition, I'll try to get it. Just because, but, but this is not only limited to roleplay books. I, it's just books in general. Mm -hmm. I really like books. Uh, I really like paper books. I am the Kindle. I read a stuff a lot of stuff on Kindle. But I like books as as an object. And uh, since I've been in this business, I like them even more because now I learned about the typography. I learned about uh, printing uh, techniques. Uh, I've been talking with people that do the covers by hand. You know. Cool stuff. It's just I don't know. I have natural attraction to it. I feel like I'm kind of a book pornographer or something. I I, I don't know what it is. I just like them. I like to touch them. I like to look at them. I, I like. Um, I appreciate the art that is behind um, uh, binding books. I, I don't know why. I cannot explain it. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, I always been into music. Um, I have a vinyl collection. I have a CD collection that I carried with me from another country because I really needed to have my favorite records with me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is definitely uh, that kind of influence. Um, and because we decided to do the book uh, in square format, uh, we in this sense, we were inspired by another game that I mentioned during the campaign, not the end. Um, mm -hmm from uh, our friends at uh, Fumble uh, GDR. And uh, the game will come out in English now. I think they have a campaign starting very soon in June, if I'm correct. Yeah, I, um, um, they, they, yeah. They, they made a square uh, book and it's quite pretty. It's, it's a nice format to, uh, especially in physical format. Um, and we wanted this game to look different. Um, and uh, the combination of the format and the uh, color scheme we're, we're trying to stick to this red and black and white uh and it's very striking i think um and somewhat uh we guessed right because i think people are noticing that this looks different from the normal stuff and this is all thanks to to, to daniel comerci um is uh he's been working with us for a long time but uh over the years, he's been working with uh, the cult people, the remarkable people, um, the Lord Smith people. Sorry, they they have this remarkable series. Uh, now they're also doing some other games. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked. He did stuff for Shadowrun and and other things. But I think he gets. He likes to work with us, even if we're smaller, uh, because we give him complete. Uh, how do you say? Uh, freedom. Like he can do whatever he wants because. Uh, because he usually delivers. Um, when I let him do what he wants, he, he usually delivers. That's that's the point. And uh, there's been very few exceptions where I ask changes. And I see that the more directions I give him, uh, the the worst is the output. So it's better to let him do his stuff, and it's usually amazing. Um, I think that the moment when we understood that Broken Tales could be so much more was the moment that he submitted an idea for the cover mm -hmm. and he sent it and I was like, don't touch it anymore. Don't do anything. This is perfect because it was very close to what it is now. He made some small changes, but it is pretty much what it is now. Mm -hmm. 
And when I saw it, I, I understood that this game, it's not going to be printed on toilet paper. Definitely not. Yeah. Like we are going to have this amazing edition and, and with this style and it's going to be beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great collaboration. And I think that, yeah, the more freedom you give to your collaborators, the better the output is usually if they know what they're doing, because sometimes the, some don't. <laughs> so, so they need the guidance, but yeah, so. Some can, some can swim in the deep end. Others others maybe need the old boogie board. Um, now how now how bi- I know that you've got that there's a few stretch goals to take into account. But how big of a page count are you shooting for with this book? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we are hovering um, around. It's not going to be a giant book, even with the stretch goals. Uh, so uh, the the core idea was around uh, to have around um, 156 pages, I think, and uh, for the broken ones it was around 100 pages. But now with all the stretch goals we unlocked, we need to see. I think they're going to be a bit bigger now. Uh, it, it's a bit hard to give you the page count now because we unlock so much stuff, and <laughs> I would need to sit down and actually count. But it's not going to be double that size because we design the stretch goals in a way that they wouldn't double the book because that becomes a very big production problem afterwards like if we have estimates for for 150 pages and then the book ends up being 400 pages the costs involved to change dramatically like dramatically so uh we don't want to do that it's just um also a matter of having an amount of work that allow us to deliver the game in more or less the time frame we suggested now we promised it for april 2020 uh we still have more than 10 days of campaign we keep unlocking stuff um i think with all the new stuff unlocked we might take a little bit more time but not not an extra year or something nothing like that uh, i think a lot of things were already accounted for and well we reached the point where we thought we would get to and we passed it. So from me here onwards, um, we need to see, but I make a point of not being horribly late with anything because I hate it as a backer and I don't want uh, to do it with my own projects. And if at some point I realize that we need to stop now with the stretch goals because otherwise we won't be able to deliver in a reasonable time frame, we will do it. I already discussed this with, uh, with the team. Of course, they're very excited. We could have stretch goals up to a million euros, but I don't want to do that. Uh, not because I hate uh, making that kind of profit, but because I want to deliver the, the product that I promised in, in a reasonable time frame. Yeah. Um, now, with now one of the other things that is going that is going to be exclusive to the Kickstarter that I was curious about is the broken ones. Um, yes. How did that? How did that start out? Yeah. So that changed significantly from the beginning of the campaign. I think that well, one thing that I don't think people understand is how in flux this stuff is until very late in the process, because um, before we make you understand what the product is, we need to understand what the product is. Uh, what. Uh, and from, from different standpoint, from the point of view of the author, from a production standpoint, from um, like how long will it take to get it done if we do it this way, uh, what kind of content it's wise to promise and what kind of content is not wise to promise, what will certainly make us delay the project. And you have all this consideration and it takes time uh and several uh, meetings to discuss this stuff and, and go through it and see all the scenarios and uh, stuff so um in the beginning uh this campaign like the core offering was a lot uh thinner and we had a lot of the content that is now there by default as a stretch goal but then we realized that it would have been much much better to have a very very solid uh, initial offering and uh, maybe reduce a bit the scope of the stretch goals uh, because um, basically we could do more stretch goals. People would be happy to see all these things unlocking 
And we would make sure that even if they don't unlock, because, well, we weren't sure they would unlock, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the core offering, it's really good. Nobody would have anything to complain about. So um, I think the very first form of the Broken Ones was just uh, uh, an extra vinyl jacket with more hunters and, and the, um, the special treasures. Uh, the book came later and after we reflected that all these big stretch goals we had in mind, basically we could collect them in, in a book and it would make a lot more sense and people probably would want them from the very beginning if we just offered them. Of course, printing two books, now both are cover in two languages it's a huge uh, production undertaking for a company like ours and that's why um, in the beginning it started as a soft cover uh, i don't know if this is widely known but uh, the difference in price when you look at production from uh, soft cover to hard cover is uh, hard cover can be even four or five times more expensive mm -hmm. so you need to think very carefully like am i gonna sell them this am i, am I gonna sell this 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 edition am i is my margin good enough? Because uh, it might be good uh, on the campaign, but then what do you do with the books that you have left after the campaign? If, uh, for example, if they go into distribution, uh, because the discounts you have to give to distribution for, for distributors to pick up your games are massive. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that the margin there makes sense. Otherwise you're basically losing money every copy of the game you sell and you definitely don't want that um, so yeah it was a different thing the broken ones and we came to this final form uh, i think it maybe was a month before the campaign started when we realized that it needs to be like this for for people to want it uh, well i think uh, the the data are proving us right in the sense that is the by far the most backed uh, reward the tier that has everything included. So I think we managed to figure out the right thing, luckily. Mm -hmm. It's horrible to find out when the campaign has started that you made a mistake there and a judgment mistake and, and people don't want what you're offering yeah. because then yeah. you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that in mind, um, what, would you be sh what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version? I'm, I'm aware that the physical version is going to take a lot longer. Yeah, um, I will have a meeting with the team after the campaign is over and we will look uh, very long and very hard at the schedule. But I'm quite confident that we could have the core book at the beginning of next year uh, and maybe the broken ones uh, after, uh, a bit after. But I don't think January is off the table I, it sounds reasonable to me we could maybe even do it faster but with christmas in the middle and holidays and not rushing and i think it's it's a good plan to uh, aim at something like january mm -hmm. so even because um one thing we did with our previous games was that we released this beta version of the digital um, uh, digital product and the community was super helpful uh, in finding typos and uh, maybe a little layout uh, issues so that uh, the, the version we could send to print was the best possible version ever. Uh, because uh, one thing is us three, four people looking at this thing. And one thing is having 500 people looking at this thing and, and noticing problems and, and noticing things that we can still fix, you know. Well, I will. I will certainly be keeping a very close eye on how on how it on how it develops. And as I mentioned before, we went live. I ended up. I ended up um, being being among the number that's ba that's backing this particular project. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting interview, I think. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for whether it's for a whether it's for more of Broken Tales or another project in the library of the World Anvil com coming to the states, uh, the door is always open. As I often say mm -hmm. around here, 
Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> sounds like uh, sounds good. I will definitely uh, keep in touch. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>